I invite you to please take out your Bibles this morning and make your way into the Old Testament to the book of Numbers. Will you please make your way to Numbers, the 16th chapter? We're going to read some verses out of Numbers 16 to start our lesson as you turn there and get ready to study. Let me just say so good to see all of you this morning. It's a blessing to be together, to be together in this place, to worship God, to do the things we've been doing today, to sing, to pray, to give. And now we're going to study. We're going to study from the Word of God. And we're going to begin with number 16 and the first three verses. Where the Bible says this, Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up. They rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly men of renown. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? What do we find going on there in those verses? Well, in those verses, my dear friends, we find something similar to what we've been studying throughout the book of Judges. We find another dark moment in the history of the nation of Israel. We find another case of rebellion and wickedness and disobedience to God. We actually find some people in Israel rebelling against their leaders. They're rebelling against their leaders. They're rebelling against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And I really want you to picture this in your mind. I want you to picture this in your mind. I want you to picture in your mind the nation of Israel in the wilderness and 250 men come before Moses and Aaron. That is more people than what we have in this room right now. 250 men come before Moses and Aaron and, and, and they're not happy. They are not happy campers. In fact, they are angry. They are furious. They basically come to Moses and Aaron and they say to them, we have had enough for you. We've had enough for you. We've had enough of being under your leadership. We've had enough of being under your authority. Why should we follow you any longer? Why should we listen to you any longer? You're not better. You're not any better than the rest of us. You're not any holier than the rest of us. We're, we're just as holy as you are. We're just as capable as you are. We're just as important to God as you are. Why do you exalt yourself over the assembly of the Lord? You see, these people are rebelling against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And the question is, why? I mean, why are they doing this? What's their problem? What's their problem with Moses? What's their problem with Aaron? Why are they grumbling? Why are they griping? Why are they rebelling against their leadership? Well, since we don't have enough time this morning to read this whole chapter, let me just quickly give you two big complaints that these rebels have on this occasion. First, let me suggest that based on what the text goes on to tell us, some of these guys, some of these rebels felt like, Moses was power hungry. Yeah, you heard me say that right. Moses, the man who sacrificed it all in Egypt to lead God's people. Moses, one of the humblest people that we can read about in the Bible. There are some people in the camp who think he's power hungry. They think he's full of ego. They feel like he has arbitrarily set himself up and set his brother up to be leaders in Israel. This guy, Korah, especially seems to feel slighted because his family wasn't chosen to be the priest. A lot of these people feel like Moses is power hungry. But then in verses 12 through 14, we learn that some of these guys also don't feel like Moses has been a really good leader. They don't feel like he's been a good leader of the people. They don't like his leadership. 
They don't like the fact that he has brought them out of Egypt and now they're wandering in the wilderness. They don't believe that he has done a good job and they could do it better. They rebelled against the leadership of Moses. And here's the question. The question is, what is Moses going to do? How is he going to respond to this? How is he going to respond to these 250 guys who come before him and want him out as a leader? Well, Moses, being the very godly and humble man that he was, he proposed this. He proposed that they let God decide. He said, let's let God decide. Let's let God decide who he wants to lead his people. That's what Moses does. That's his proposal in verses four through seven. And when you drop down in the text, you see that the next day in verses 31 through 35, that's exactly what happened. God acted on Moses' proposal as this rebellion was only getting larger and stronger. God ordered the people away from the tents of the rebels And he unleashed his judgment. He unleashed his wrath. He poured out his wrath. He caused the ground to open up and swallow these rebels alive. He put this rebellion down in a very powerful way. And you would think that after witnessing all of that, the people would have learned their lesson. But they didn't. They didn't learn their lesson at all. When you drop down to verse 41, you see that after this event, the people continued to give Moses and Aaron a hard time. They continued to grumble. They continued to gripe and complain. Some of them even blamed Moses and Aaron for what happened to the rebels. And God responded to that. God responded to their griping by sending a plague throughout the camp of Israel that killed 14,000 people. Until it was finally checked. This is another dark time. In the history of Israel. And the question is. What can we learn? What can we learn from this very dark moment. In the history of Israel. What can we learn from how God. Deals with these rebels. In the wilderness. Well, I believe that the main lesson. The main lesson we learn from these rebels in the wilderness is God wasn't pleased with their behavior. God wasn't pleased with their conduct. God wasn't pleased with them rebelling against the leadership of Moses. God especially wasn't pleased with this guy named Korah. You see Korah there mentioned in verse one. This guy Korah that's mentioned there is a very interesting guy. He's the one who seems to start this rebellion in Israel, and believe it or not, but he's actually related to Moses and Aaron. He, he's actually their first cousin. He is close kinfolk, and he does some very evil things in this chapter. One thing he does in this chapter is he plays the part of an armchair quarterback. You know what an armchair quarterback is? An armchair quarterback is this. An armchair quarterback is when someone criticizes a real quarterback from their lazy boy. They criticize a real quarterback from their recliner that's in their living room. They can't throw a football 15 or 20 yards, but they'll criticize Patrick Mahomes. And they'll criticize Russell Wilson. And they'll criticize Aaron Rodgers. They'll sit comfortably in their lazy boy and they'll criticize their decisions, their throws. They'll criticize their performances. They'll criticize the performances of people who actually can do the job. They'll criticize the coaches. They'll criticize the training staff. They'll criticize the GM. They'll criticize the people who actually have expertise at this at this work. That's what an armchair quarterback is. And that's what Corey is. He's an armchair quarterback. He believes Moses is a bad leader. He believes Moses is doing a terrible job. He believes that he is just as qualified to do what Moses is doing. In fact, he believes that he can even do it better. He says, I can be a better leader than Moses. I I can do what Moses is doing at an even higher level. He doesn't want to accept the fact that God has put Moses and Aaron in the positions that they are in. He is playing the part of an armchair quarterback. And you know what else he's doing? He's displaying discontentment. 
He's displaying discontentment. Someone says, what do you mean by that? Well, by that I mean that he is discontent with God's plan at this time. And Moses says that. Drop down and look at verse number 8, please. In verse number 8 of number 16, as Moses rebu rebukes Korah, he says this to him in verse number 8. Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi. It is not enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them and that he has brought you near Korah and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you and are you also seeking for the priesthood? You see what Moses is saying there to Korah? You see what he's charging him with on this occasion? He is letting us know that Korah is not satisfied with his current position. He is not satisfied with the work that he had at the tabernacle. He doesn't like the fact that the plan of God specifies that only Aaron and his son can be the priest. Korah doesn't like that. He's like, I want to be a priest. I want to do what Aaron is doing. I want my family to be the family of priests. Korah is discontent with the plan of God. And let me tell you something, my friends, we can be just like him today. Korah has a spirit of discontentment, and we can also have a spirit of discontentment. In fact, whenever we add to the qualifications that God has for elders in the church, that is exactly the kind of spirit we have. We have the same spirit as Korah. Like Korah, when we, when we are dissatisfied with the plan of God, we'll find ourselves saying things like, God's plan's not good enough now. God, I know what it says in 1 Timothy 3. I know what it says in Titus chapter 1, but, but that's not good enough. God, you've missed some qualifications. God, I know a little bit more about what it takes to be an elder than you do. That's exactly the kind of spirit that we can have when we go beyond the family qualifications God has given and the teaching qualifications that God has given and the character qualifications God has given. When we say things like, well, I think he needs to be this age or I think his kids need to be this age or I think his kids should have been Christians for this long, we're being just like Korah, being just like him. We're not content with what God has said. We're not content with God's plan. We think we know better than God about this matter. And so Korah is displaying a spirit of discontentment with God's plan, and the result of that is he forms a faction. He forms a faction. Instead of going to Moses in private with his complaints, instead of seeking to be unselfish and praying about this and rehearsing in his mind all of the good things that God has done for them through Moses, you know what he does? He stirs up a bunch of people. He stirs up a bunch of people. He, he voices displeasure to a bunch of people. He complains. He gossips. He organizes a mutiny. He organizes a large group of people that he has influence with to be on his side so he can remove the current leadership. He forms a faction to rebel against the leadership. And brothers and sisters, when he does that, you know what he really does? He rebels against God. You see, by rebelling against Moses and Aaron, what Korah is really doing is he's rebelling against God. And I know that because the verse says so. Drop down to verse 11. And number 16 in verse 11, Moses goes on to say to Korah, therefore you and all your company are gathered together against who? Against the Lord. You're gathered together against the Lord, but as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? Moses says that what was really going on here is Korah and these rebels were rebelling against God. Someone says, well, how are they rebelling against God? Well, think about it. God was the one ultimately responsible for putting Moses and Aaron in their leadership positions. 
God was the one who had called Moses. God was the one who had called Aaron. God was the one who had appointed these men to their responsibilities. That means that when they griped against them, they were griping against God. When they complained against them, they were complaining against God. When they rose up against them, they were rising up against God. And the result of that was the judgment of God. It was the wrath of God. It was God killing them in a horrifying way. God was not pleased with the conduct of these rebels. And my dear friends, that same thing holds true today. That same thing holds true today, even in the church. Even today in the church, God is not pleased when we rebel against those that he puts in positions of authority. Now, that would include a lot of different people. That would include people in government, right? That would include teachers, principals, parents, husbands who have the responsibility to lead their families in the ways of God, and shepherds and elders, elders in the local church. You see, as a church with four elders right now, and very soon we're going to be appointing some more elders we got to make sure that as we go into this, we avoid having the spirit of the rebels in the wilderness. We got to make sure that we avoid having the spirit of Korah and doing the actions of Korah. We got to understand that if we're not careful, we can be just like them. You can be just like them. I can be just like them. I can be just like them. Like them, I can, I can be a complainer. I can be a, a, a griper, a grumbler, a gossip. I can participate in ungodly criticism towards the leadership. I can form a faction. I can divide this church. I can split this church. I can be loud and rally the troops and attempt to get a bunch of people on my side. I can bring my leaders a lot of grief and a lot of stress. I mean, can you imagine all of the grief and stress that Moses and Aaron are under on this occasion? Can you imagine that? I mean, you and I both know that Moses has already had a pretty stressful life up to this point, right? I mean, think about it. He's had to confront the most powerful man in the world at this time, the Pharaoh of Egypt, on numerous occasions. And he's had to lead a couple of million people out of Egyptian slavery and across the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. And he's had to hear them constantly complain about water and bread and meat and wanting to return to Egypt. And when he came down from the mountain with the law of God, he had to see them worshiping a golden calf. He had to see them participate in idolatry and breaking their covenant with God. And there was even a time when these people tried to kill him because he had faith that God would bless them to take the promised land once the spies returned. And there was even a time when his own brother Aaron and his sister Miriam, they tried to uh, usurp his authority and rebel against him. And God had to get involved and put that down. Moses has gone through a lot of stress. A lot of stress on this occasion, and this only adds to it. It only adds to it. And I'm reminded of a scripture. Will you go in your New Testament to the book of Hebrews, please? I'm reminded of a scripture in Hebrews 13 and verse 17. I want to consider this passage a couple of times before we close this morning. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, the Hebrew writer says this. He's talking to Christians here. And he says in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. For this would be unprofitable to you. So what do we see there in that passage? Well, in that passage, we see that as Christians, we can do to our leaders what Korah and the rebels did to their leaders. From this passage, we see that we can bring grief and stress to our leaders. In fact, that's exactly what we do whenever we gripe and complain and we're selfish and we gossip and form factions and rebel and try to undermine their influence in the church. 
we do the same thing. And so here's my final question. Here's my question. How can we avoid that? How can we avoid being like these people in number 16? How can we avoid not being rebels in the wilderness, but being rebels in the church? Well, let me give you three things to think about. Three things to think about very quickly. First, we can avoid being like these rebels in the wilderness by submitting. By submitting. And are, you, are you still in Hebrews 13, 17? I want you to notice two words in the beginning of that passage. Look, look at two words there. It's the words obey and submit. Do you see those two words coming from the Holy Spirit? Obey and submit. Obey and submit. Those two words, obey and submit, are critical words. They are words that when you look them up, they carry the idea of yielding. We are to yield to our elders. Yield how? Not yield when it comes to matters of law. Elders don't make law. They don't make law in the church. You know who makes law in the church? The Lord does. The head of the church makes the law. Jesus Christ makes the law. We don't submit to elders in case of, case of law. They are not to add anything to the word of God. When the Bible says obey and submit here, it's talking about obeying and submitting to them in matters of judgment. Matters of judgment. You see, much of what elders or shepherds do are matters of judgment. It involves judgment. It involves making decisions that are not necessarily right or wrong, but they are matters of judgment. They are areas where God allows them to use their judgment. And examples of this include things like deciding on whether or not we're going to pave the parking lot. Deciding on whether we're going to use Lord's Supper packets or not. Deciding on whether or not we're going to put songs on the slide or not. Deciding on which preachers we're going to support or whether we're going to have a Sunday evening or what time Wednesday Bible class is going to be. Or when exactly we're going to withdraw from a sinful brother or a sinful sister or even the process we're going to use to appoint more shepherds. None of those issues are matters of Scripture. None of those issues have anything to do with book, chapter, and verse. None of those issues are black and white issues. All of those matters are matters of judgment. They're judgment calls. They're judgment calls that elders or shepherds are allowed to make, and God says you need to submit to them in matters of judgment. Submit to them in matters of judgment, even if you don't get your way. Even if you don't agree, even if you prefer it be done another way, the Bible says that when it comes to matters of judgment, we are to avoid confusion and division and bitterness and grumbling, and we need to submit. We obey and we submit. Not in matters of law, because only God makes the law. In matters of judgment. That's how we avoid being like the rebels, but not only do we submit, you know what else we're supposed to do to avoid being like these people? We need to honor and esteem. And I'm going in my Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, please. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to come back to Hebrews again if you want to just put a Bible marker there. But in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12, the, the, the Bible says this. Paul says this to the church in Thessalonica. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. Now, here's the key part here. Who have charge over you. Now, let's just know who he's talking about there. These are people who have charge over the folks in this group. Who have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Notice how unlike what was going on with Korah and the rebels, God expects us to constantly think about what our local church leaders do for us. 
He wants us to appreciate what they do for us. He wants us to appreciate their work and appreciate all they're doing to lead us and protect us and watch over our souls. He wants us to appreciate the sacrifices they're making to do, the, to do this work. He wants us to appreciate how some of them do this work while struggling with poor health at times. And they got to sacrifice a lot of time away from their families. And some of them have to do this work while still working a full time secular job and raising kids. Instead of complaining about these things and griping about these things, we need to be thankful. We need to honor these men. We need to hold them in high esteem. We need to praise God that they have met the qualifications and they are willing to take on this work. We need to submit and honor and esteem. And let me close with this. We need to seek to bring them joy. Bring them joy and not grief. Going back to Hebrews 13 one more time, such a critical passage. Well, the scripture says again, Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. They're going to give an account for their for their work to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, because of that, let them do this with joy and not with grief. For this would be unprofitable to you. What's that verse about? The last part of that verse. Well, in the last part of that verse, we find a warning, a warning from God. When God warns us, it's time to sit up and listen. It's time to listen very carefully. God says, God says that if we follow in the footsteps of the rebels in the wilderness, it's not going to be good for us. It is not going to be profitable. God says that instead of making it our mission to bring our leaders grief and stress, we need to do our best to try to bring them joy. We need to bring them joy. How do we bring them joy? Well, we bring them joy by doing the first two things, by submitting, by obeying them in matters of judgment, by yielding in matters of judgment, by honoring and esteeming them, by being unselfish, by being gracious, by putting the work of God above our pride and our egos, by stripping ourselves of pride, and stripping ourselves of bitterness and avoiding pouting and causing division and refusing to get involved in God's work because we didn't get our way. By being patient. By being kind. By loving each other and loving them and giving them all the things that love demands, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. By assuming the best in them. Assuming the best in their words and in their actions and in their attentions by understanding that just like there are no perfect spouses and no perfect children and grandchildren and, and, and perfect people and preachers. There are no. There are no perfect elders. There are no perfect elders. Elders make mistakes. Elders will never lead us perfectly. They are fallible human beings, and at times they need us to cut them some slack. They need us to be gracious and understanding and respectful. And if we do have a problem with something they do or a decision they make, we need to work it out the right way. And that's go to them in private and settle it in private and not in front of other people. That's the right thing to do. That's how we can be different than these people in the wilderness. And so as we get ready very soon to appoint some new leaders, I really hope this lesson will help us, starting with me. I hope it will help us. I hope it will help us strive for peace and harmony between us and our leaders. I hope it will help us take our respect and the respect we're supposed to have for them very seriously. I hope it will help us avoid a spirit of rebellion. I hope it will help us understand that to rebel against our leaders is a sign of spiritual immaturity and it is equal 
to rebelling against God. It's equal to rebelling against Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Let's be mindful of those things as we pray right now. Would you pray with me, please? Let us pray. Almighty God, we bow our heads with humble hearts this morning, thanking you for another day of worship. And we pray, Father, that you look into our hearts right now, that you examine our hearts and help us have hearts that are pure and holy and that are very, and that are very different than the hearts and the spirits of those people in the time of Moses who rebelled against his leadership. Help us, Father, always submit and obey and yield and honor and esteem and seek to bring our leaders that you have blessed us with joy and not grief. Help us, Father, do our part in this work in this church and to treat your leaders in the way that you demand so that we don't have to experience your judgment and wrath. Please, God, bless us as we move forward trying to always have qualified leadership in this place, your church, in Jesus' name and amen. Thank you all so much for listening this morning. I really appreciate it. We've been talking about rebelling against God and how that's not good. We don't rebel against God, don't need to rebel against God. I want to close by asking you, are you rebelling against God? Are you rebelling against God right now in your life? If so, it's time to stop. It's time to stop right here and right now. It's time to obey. It's time to submit. It's time to yield to the law of God, to believe in his son, repent of your sins, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Give your life to the Lord before it's too late. And if we can help you with that, come to the front. Let's stand. Let's sing. Oh, say.